games are boring when there's nothing in them. That's why we painstakingly design and build as fun, interesting and artistic worlds as we can. While level building can range anywhere between therapeutic and mind-numbingly boring uh, for a lot of people, there, there's a little bit more to keep in mind than just plopping down your favourite shape boulder assets. From ensuring the level supports the actual gameplay, from the effects your uh, assets have on actual performance, and how it affects the player's experience. That's why I've compiled this comprehensive list of 12 practical rules you should keep in mind when building your own game worlds. Let's get to it. Blocking is exactly like sketching out a drawing before you start drawing. It gives you a chance to see a physical prototype of your ideas before you fully commit. With it, not only can you see what does and doesn't work visually and refine gameplay dependent areas, but it allows you to test what you're planning to build. It's not just about environmental detail, but how the level works within the context of gameplay. For example, you may block out an area in a platformer. Without blocking, you may commit to an idea, only to realise near the end that some aspects don't really work. In some cases, it might be simple to move these elements around and adapt, but if it's a complex scene where elements of a level rely on one another, you could find yourself sifting through more than you actually bargained for. Initial ideas don't always work the way you think they do. That's why prototyping the core gameplay concept is so important. So why wouldn't we do that with world building? Modular assets are pieces of a larger set that fit modularly together to form, for example, a building or other things. By breaking what would otherwise be a larger single mesh down into individual pieces, you unlock numerous benefits. Easier placement. Pieces will snap together perfectly when aligning them around in a game engine, meaning no more painstaking zooming for infinity trying to line up objects together. Flexible building. You can be dynamic with which pieces you place together, therefore changing the entire layout or style of the level. You can go from a wall, to a window, to a door, to a corner, to a broken door, to a portrait of my dad. Have you seen this man? I need to know! As long as the pieces visually work together, any piece will work with any other piece, and you can create variations of the same piece for more variety in the world. Performance. Environments can effectively benefit from a number of performance improving techniques such as occlusion culling, something we'll talk about later. Creating your own modular assets can be as simple or as difficult as you make it, and sometimes, of course, you might have some teething issues with some pieces. When creating your own, keep in mind, you can go as granular as you want dimensions wise, but ensure varying fitting pieces are scaled with the rest. For example, if you have a 2x2 two two and a 1x1 one one set of wall pieces, you may find you'll need the same variation for floor and corner pieces, otherwise you'll have a gap where these pieces don't adhere to a 1x1 one one gap, for example. When modelling, remember to use snap grid positioning. Not only does it make it easier to ensure pieces fit together perfectly, but it takes the burden of non-snapping positioning away. If you've ever tried doing it without snapping, you'll know what I mean. Some engines allow you to snap pieces together with vertices, but this isn't always as reliable as just moving pieces around on a grid. Keep the origin point in mind, as this will make asset placement even easier in the game engine. You'll have to get your head around how to create modular levels, but once you've got it down, you'll be flying. What the fuck? Before you know it, you've built a level, assets all over the place. Next, you decide to swap the texture of a modular building piece with another one. No problem. You place the texture down and... Oh, God. The sweat builds up on your brow. The voice softly whispers in your ear. Great job. Now do it for every single one. Prefabs to the rescue. Unity's Prefab and Unreal Engine's Blueprint system are instanced game objects, meaning they all point to a single source. Any changes to the source are reflected across all of its instances. Instances can deviate from the source as much as you want, and you can choose to apply the changes made to a single instance to the source or any of the other instances. They're super easy to create and use. If there's one thing you should at least try from this video, it's this. Honestly, it will save you so much time. I've made this mistake loads of times while building my own levels. It's super easy to do, especially when you're in the flow of things. 
I've even ended up having to make a Unity tool to replace all the selected scene objects with a selected prefab. It's a serious pain. Don't be afraid to model assets you need. Not everything will be available within your budget, asset packs, or even art style. The learning curve can and does turn people away. There's no denying it can be daunting and or feel almost over cumbersome learning an entirely new discipline. But once you get the hang of it, you'll find that you can easily make what you're looking for with some practice, learning and patience, depending on what sort of quality you're looking for. If you do choose to model something yourself, keep in mind two quick things. Remember the scale. It helps to have a reference model when you're modeling and where the model's origin point should be. That will define how it's placed in the engine. I know we mentioned that before, but it really is important that when you're modeling something, the origin point is something that you think about first. First. The learning curve scales with the fidelity and realism that your art style demands, but unless you're looking for AAA quality assets, you'll be just fine. Some asset stores and sites are better than others. For example, Unreal Engine has a whole range of AAA quality assets, even from Epic themselves. But remember, you're not tied down to any of these asset stores. There's a whole world of sites out there with assets to share and a whole plethora of creators out there who really want to share the assets they've made. So you chose to model. Great. There's just one more thing, though your model's UVs. All models have UVs. These represent how a model displays a texture around itself. Long story short, a UV's coordinates go from zero to one, both along the X and Y axes. The vertices on a model are then given a coordinate on this UV graph, defining how a texture shows on the model. How you unwrap a model and lay them out on this graph will give you different results, and it can easily become infuriating to start. You can choose to paint textures directly on the model, which you may find easy to do, albeit with its own learning curve. Using pre-made textures from online is a whole nother thing since you're defining the model's UVs based on the texture rather than the texture on the model's UVs. Modeling software such as Blender allow you to define UVs and create textures right within the program itself. This is how a lot of game devs on YouTube create their own assets, especially those that you see in devlogs. Creating textures is fine and dandy, until you realise that it needs to repeat across single or multiple models, it can very quickly become a pain. That's why on the seventh day, God made seamless textures. Seamless textures are textures that, when fitted together, repeat without obvious seams that take away from the illusion they're tiling. This is one of the biggest time savers, especially when it comes to modular assets, as it looks seamless right off the bat. The most important thing to keep in mind when using seamless textures is the UVs. If they're not correct or are even offset a slight bit, they will create artificial seams, defeating the purpose of the texture and your effort. As seamless textures are just a pattern, you can actually create them yourself. Programs such as A-Sprite or Photoshop can actually make it easy to make your own seamless art for your game. If creating your own seamless textures is not part of your prophecy, as always, there are some resources online which will help you get some instead. Notably, fellow game dev Samyam made Pixelo, an amazing website dedicated to hosting procedural textures created via Stable Diffusion algorithm. While not focused on seamless textures, a lot of the textures found here happen to be seamless. There's a lot of use cases here, so make sure to check it out using the link on screen or in the description below. Everybody knows about it when it comes to programming, but how can it be applied to world building? Sticking to best practices in optimization can help make all the difference between a stuttery mess and smooth gameplay. There are many different optimization techniques when it comes to world building, not just limited to purely graphical. I've picked out a few that I feel are more pertinent to this video. Keep in mind, I will be explaining these techniques in context to Unity, However, the theory and use case of them will still be universal across game engines. At the end of the day, the best thing to do is to make sure you're not just shoving everybody and their dog into the level. Does a dog poo in the woods? It doesn't matter how many optimization techniques you use, your level just won't run if it's more crowded than a dog. Dax livestream! <laughs> All models are composed of vertices. The more vertices, the more processing they must undergo before they're rendered. Depending on hardware, this can be quick or slow and will only increase as you add more models. With this in mind, it's important to manage the amount, whether it's a model you made yourself or one that you've downloaded. You may find you don't need high vertice counts to convey detail in a mesh. Instead, 
you could use normal maps, height maps and even textures in general to provide the illusion of detail you're looking for without the burden of graphical processing. Static objects are literally that. Static. They don't move and they're guaranteed to never move during runtime. Because of that, game engines are able to take advantage by pre-computing various information about these objects to be used in different engine systems, saving on runtime performance costs. In the example of, but not limited to, Unity, static objects are included in occlusion culling, navigation mesh baking, global illumination baking, and reflection probe baking. While some of these features can be performed at runtime, the processing power required can affect performance and gameplay critical areas, or entirely dropkick lower end devices out the window. Level of detail or LODs are variations of the same mesh with increasing amounts of vertices for more detail. These meshes are swapped with for one another depending on the camera's distance. If a detail mesh is 100 units away, there's no point rendering it at 10,000 vertices given the camera won't even be able to display that detail. This is the key behind this technique, as it can save more resources than you initially think. Finding that sweet spot between each detail will take some trial and error, but when you you get it. It will greatly benefit the performance of the world you're building, while keeping the detailed models you've worked hard on in the game, just rendered smartly. Again, it does take some fiddling, but it really is worth the trouble. Most modern engines by default won't render meshes behind and outside the camera's thrust room, but that still leaves the meshes inside. That's where our secret weapon comes in. Occlusion culling is a God of performance gains. It's a great way of optimizing the world you're building. What's not visible isn't rendered. What's the point of rendering meshes that will only be overlaid by another mesh during the rendering process? It's a waste of processing power. Engines like Unity can take that information and calculate whether other objects obscured behind it, both static or dynamic, should be rendered at all. In Unity, occlusion culling invites another unique concept, Portals. Portals are defined as areas that block or reveal meshes behind them. Now, why is this useful? Say you have a door leading to another highly detailed room. Objects splayed everywhere. I'm talking like your room in your parents' basement. Since doors rotate open, in the case of Unity, you can't make them occlude a static, as meshes behind the door won't render even when the door is physically open. That information has been pre-computed. Adding an occlusion portal to the door allows you to programmatically toggle whether the occlusion culling should occur within the bounding box. So when the door is closed, the other room is completely occluded and visible again when opened. Draw calls are literally calls to the graphical API to draw everything. What makes this important is it's a resource heavy process. Without scene optimizations, the number of calls may increase, therefore increasing the intensity of those calls and affecting graphical runtime performance. With optimizations, you can achieve fewer calls and more performant experience. There's many techniques you can use to help reduce the number of draw calls. Here, we're only gonna go over uh, one or two. Again, while these may be direct features of Unity, the theory remains across all engines. GPU instancing is the process of batching multiple instances of the same mesh with the same material together during the render process. Instead of rendering out each mesh one at a time, it will render those batched meshes within the same draw call. This is an extremely powerful optimization for scenes with many of the same mesh decorated throughout. The main limitation, however, is that it's not particularly as efficient with meshes of 256 vertices due to how the work required to render isn't distributed efficiently on the GPU. A great video that demonstrates the power of GPU instancing is Craig Perko's video. Craig makes some great videos imperative to game dev theory and implementation of various game dev disciplines. You should definitely check him out. If you haven't already, head on over to his channel and unlock the knowledge of gods. This heavily relates to what we discussed earlier about static objects. Making objects static doesn't just allow various systems to milk off pre-computed data, but helps with graphical performance. Making game objects static allows them to be combined into a single buffer. It allows illegible meshes to be 
handled across one buffer rather than spread across many. While this doesn't actually reduce the number of draw calls, it enforces minimal render state changes, in turn lightening the load of each draw call. This is definitely something to keep in mind if you can't reduce draw calls anymore, but want to help lessen the intensity. The only downside to this technique is that it requires additional CPU memory. This may or may not be something you need to account for and is scene and device dependent, but don't worry about it too much given the performance trade-off. And there you have it, 12 practical tips to keep in mind when you're next building a world for your game. Remember, if the engine doesn't have these features or techniques, the theory of them should still be applicable. So uh, if you do decide to implement them if you can, at some point in the future, they'll serve you well. If you have any more practical world building tips, I'd love to hear them. Put them in the comments below for the entire community to see and discuss. And quite frankly, I need some more myself. If you enjoyed the video, please like, share and subscribe for more things games, games dev and all things Dark Dags. Follow me on Twitter for ramblings of a madman and on Twitch where you can slowly become as delusional as I am. A man in turn accuses her of heresy. Ooh. Can you get your big head off the screen, please? If you'd like to support me, the channel and creation of content, head on over to my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash darkdax and pledge as much or as little or nothing at all. At the end of the day, I'm thankful you even watched. Now if you excuse me, I'm off to finally finish the project that I've been working on for months. And months. And months 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 and